Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. My name is PJ Carefoot. I'm the head of the Department of Special Collections and Rare Books. And before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Many of you as donors will know that the initiatives of the Thomas Fisher Rear Book Library have featured prominently in the successes of the university's $2.4 billion boundless campaign. I am very pleased that, to have the chance to thank you once again for your contributions, which nurture collections and services for students, faculty, and researchers. If you would like to know how you can support the library in the Boundless Campaign, my colleague Megan Campbell, whom I'm sure you all know, where's Megan? There, there's Megan, uh, will be very happy to talk to you. So welcome then to this year's first Friends of the Fisher Library Lectures. We are so pleased to have Mrs. Doreen Seltzer and her son Gareth and some of her friends with us this evening at this, the 20th annual Seltzer Lecture delivered in memory of Mr. Seltzer's husband, John, and her son, Mark. Tonight's presenter is Professor Nick Wilding. Dr. Wilding is an historian of early modern Europe, the history of science, as well as the history of the book. He is a graduate of New College, Oxford, and has a master's degree from the University of Warwick. His doctoral dissertation focused on natural philosophy and communication in early modern Europe, and since 2007, he has served as assistant professor at the Georgia State University. In 2012, Professor Wilding was able to prove on the basis of forensic evidence that a special edition of the Sidereus Nuncius of Galileo, consisting of unknown ink drawings found in 2005, was in fact a forgery. And we are delighted to have him speak to us this evening about the process that brought him to that conclusion. Professor Wilding. Thank you very much for that. Am I audible? No? No? Did I press Is it on? Button? No, you haven't pushed it. That one? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Technology is not my strong point. There we go. Is that better? There we go. Okay. Now I'm booming. Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks to the library for the invitation, and thank you for um, your generous uh, donation to the uh, the library. Today I'd like to talk to you about um, this Galileo book and also a large number of other forgeries which have emerged uh, over the last 10 years um, and are continuing to emerge. I found another Sidereus Nuntius forgery yesterday uh, and I haven't heard back from the people who uh, bought it whether they were aware of that fact yet. So I'm not going to say where that is yet, but this is part of an ongoing investigation, uh, and not just a scholarly investigation, a criminal investigation. Um, so let's start off by uh, answering the basic kind of elevator question, or uh, my mother-in-law's question, why does this book matter? Why does Galileo matter? So very briefly, um, from about 500 BCE through to about 1600 CE, uh, the universe was geocentric. Um, and then the alternative model, uh, which had been uh, conceived of in ancient Greece, of a heliocentric universe, started to gain initially mathematical and then subsequently uh, physical evidence. Uh, there were other alternative explanations floating around, such as the hybridized Tychonic system, uh, but that's just too messy to be true. Uh, and we now live in a heliocentric universe. The clincher, although not um, this wasn't definitive evidence, but the instrument that demolished the Aristotelian Ptolemaic universe was Galileo's telescope. This is a modification of a kind of 
low-power toy that was being touted for military use, which he adapted into a, by modern standards, still very low-powered, but by contemporary standards, nobody had ever seen anything like this. It could magnify uh, 30 times. Uh, this is the sole surviving uh, telescope in the Museo Galileo in Florence. Um, so in the winter of 1609, 1610, Galileo, along with other people, uh, turned this new astronomical uh, telescope to the heavens, and he made a series, in, in the space of uh, just a few weeks, he made a series of quite stunning discoveries. One of them was the ruggedness of the moon. The moon was supposed to be a perfect sphere, and yet he could see mountain ridges, valleys, he could mathematically calculate the height of those mountains, um, and he made those lovely sketches. There's his diagrammatization where he shows us that moon mountains are about three miles high, and he's not far off. He also saw lots and lots of new stars. This was a dangerous thing to see. Giordano Bruno had uh, been burnt at the stake in 1600, not mainly for his astronomical beliefs, uh, mainly for just standard crazy heresies, but the ast astronomical uh, theory of an infinite universe didn't win him any uh, friends in the, um, in the Holy Office. Galileo expanded the universe and saw what he described as an infinite number of stars. And if there are an infinite number of stars, maybe the universe is infinite, and maybe there are infinite numbers of Earths, and maybe there are infinite numbers of incarnations of infinite Jesuses. And then the Bible starts to look a bit wonky. So this was a slightly dangerous thing to see. Um, most surprisingly, uh, at the start of January, uh, January 7th, we have uh, a kind of logbook of his nightly observations. He saw uh, little, what he initially thought were stars near Jupiter. But he realized that, they, that as Jupiter moved, the stars were moving with them. And he very quickly, within the space of less than a week, realized that what he was seeing was a, uh, a moon system. Um, and this was interesting to him because it provided another center of rotation in the universe. So uh, the argument that the Earth must be the center because our moon goes round it and it looks like everything else goes round it too uh, has a physical counter-argument. Well, there's another planet with moons too, so maybe we're not the center of everything. He published extremely swiftly. So these observations take place between November and uh, late January 1609-1610. On the 13th of March uh, 1610, uh, his book came out. Um, not a long book. This is a facsimile of it, but the right size. About 60 pages. Um, a largish quarto. Um, the Siderius Nuncius, first published in Venice in 550 copies. Uh, subsequently that summer, uh, reprinted in Frankfurt, and there's a, uh, the much rarer Frankfurt copy. Uh, there's one of those here in the Fisher. Um, and in this uh, publication, he used a variety of media and techniques in order to visually display and reenact for the reader what it was that he'd seen. So these uh, etchings, which might possibly be in Galileo's own hand, we're not sure, appeared in almost all of the copies, not all of them. The etchings are printed on a separate press than the, the letter press that uh, is used for type and woodcuts. And about 30 copies, it looks like, didn't go through there. Um, and I'll show you a an image of a real one, but here's a facsimile um, based on um, one of the copies which didn't get those etchings. You can see that there are blanks where most copies have the etchings put in. And that's going to be important in the story I'm going to tell you. Um, there were woodcuts showing those uh, demonstrations of how to calculate the height of a mountain on a moon. Uh, the asterisms got very nicely blown up. Uh, most copies of the Sidereus Nuncius have been trimmed down quite drastically. There are four copies of the surviving 
we know of about 90 copies from that initial print run of 550. There are four which have not been cut down at all. So you can see the initial, uh, the, the full sheets have these uh, star diagrams and which extend almost to the edge and very wide margins on the, um, on the pages. And the nightly observations of the satellites of Jupiter uh, and uh, are reproduced using typographical characters, so uh, asterisks of different sizes, very carefully uh, placed to show how, they, how we're looking at their, um, their rotation at a slight angle. Now, in 2005, uh, so this is an important book in the history of thought, in the history of astronomy, in the history of humankind's relationship with the cosmos. It provides the empirical data by which the uh, Ptolemaic Aristotelian cosmos can start to be dismantled. It doesn't provide concrete, definitive evidence that we live in a heliocentric universe but it definitely starts to make the Earth seem like other places, makes the Moon seem like the Earth, makes Jupiter seem like the Earth. So it changes the nature of the, of the universe, and it's beautifully written. It's one of the most exciting reads in the history of science. Copies were selling for anywhere between a quarter of a million and a million dollars. Not that that's important, but it's part of the story. In 2005, a copy appeared on the market, uh, which was uh, very, very special in very many ways, it turned out. Um, we'll look in detail at each of the elements that distinguish this copy. The first thing that was weird about it, as I said, there, usually there are lunar etchings, uh, a series of uh, five etchings. One of them's a, a repeat, but there are five etchings. So, so that's what the... Uh, Library of Congress copy, one of the uncut copies, looks like. But some copies don't have that etching in them. And they're genuine, they're perfectly uh, real, they just didn't go, didn't get the etchings put in them. Now what makes this new copy, which we'll call the Martian Land copy, because that's the name of the dealer who purchased it, um, Martian Land based in New York, History of Science um, dealer, what made that this new copy, uh, so special, was that it didn't have the etchings, but it didn't have blanks either. It had um, drawings or light wash ink uh, sketches. And those light wash uh, ink sketches were analyzed by a German uh, historian of art, Horst Bredekamp, who was in the process of writing a big book about uh, the process of visual, visualization in thought, uh, concentrating on Galileo, and by looking at the ways that the brush strokes were built up, he said that these were Galileo's own autograph drawings. And he uh, therefore uh, concocted a theory that these were uh, the basis for the etchings. They weren't just put in a defective copy, they were actually the paradigmatic uh, copies upon which the etchings were um, based. Now, if we look at each of the elements in this Ma the Martin Lamb copy, you'll see that the title page has been modified in a series of ways which are quite, quite normal for early modern books. There is a library stamp on the far left, that lozenge, and there's a, an inscription at the bottom. You get this a lot in early modern books. What was important here is the nature of these two um, signs. First off, this library stamp uh, has a, you can see the little spotted uh, putty cat there. That's a lynx, apparently. That's what lynxes look like in uh, 1610, apparently. Um, they were still wild in the Dolomites, and Galileo probably uh, cut one of their eyes open to see how they could see so well. Um, it was dead, it's okay. Um, now the lynx becomes the symbol of uh, sharp-sightedness, and it becomes the emblem of the first scientific academy uh, to come into existence, the Academia de Lince, based in Rome, run by a wealthy uh, prince called Federico Cesi. Um, 
Chesey built up a very, very nice library, mainly of natural philosophy, but also other subjects. When he died, and, and he stamped all of his, uh, his books with his library stamp, uh, his library was dispersed upon his death. Most of it ended up in a shipwreck and sunk, but uh, what remained of it has ended up in four main libraries, in Montpellier, Bologna, uh, Rome, and I'm blanking on the fourth. Uh, no, two places in Rome, the Vatican and the modern-day Lynchian Academy. So the Martian land copy has the Lynchian stamp, and that means that this copy belonged to the Lynchian Academy, and Galileo, largely as a result of publishing this book in 1610, was elected in 1611 as a member of the fledgling academy, and he was extremely proud of this academic uh, um, title. So this is a really good provenance mark for us. It's a, uh, a sign that this book was uh, between, at some point between its publication in 1610 and the um, dispersal of the library in 1630, uh, it belonged to Chesey's patron, uh, to uh, Galileo's patron and friend Federico Chesey. However, if you take a random sample of extant uh, library stamps from collections who've had their books for a long time, which is the kind of geeky thing that I do, you will find that they all share uh, certain characteristics. And one of those characteristics is that the wooden stamp that was used, um, either right at the get-go or very early, uh, has a large break in the inner border there. And if you look at the stamp on the uh, Sidereus Nuncius, there is an intact line. So in Chase's library, books that entered the library before the Galileo have uh, that break in the, uh, the stamp, which makes me think that the stamp is not genuine, and therefore that that provenance is bogus. And there are other minor variants there, uh, little ligatures and things missing in the lettering. Um, I think there's the right number of spots on the leopard. On, not leopard, links. Um, now, just at the moment when I was studying, I was writing a review of the, uh, there was a, a large academic study of this book, of the, the specific copy, the Martin Land copy, because the stakes were so high on this. It was valued at $10 million. Yeah, you heard right. Uh, Richard Lann of Martin Lann had paid half a million for it. So that's a pretty, uh, that's every dealer's dream to find a, an undervalued book like this. He'd done uh, the reputable thing, got a team of academics who were um, not involved financially in this in any way to analyze the book. So they took it, they compared it to other extant copies, they looked at the paper, they looked at the uh, inscription as we will do in a, in a minute. They looked at the library stamp, but not very closely. Uh, they looked at the drawings of the moon, and their conclusion was that this was Galileo's own copy of uh, the Sidereus Nuncius. The inscription that we'll come back to says, I, Galileo, Galileo did this. And they also concluded that the thing that he did was not just write the book, but do those drawings as well. And that's why it has a $10 million price tag on it, because it was Galileo's autograph kind of prototype copy, his proof copy, they claimed, with the uh, original drawings. Now, a lot of that doesn't make much sense because proof copies don't exist, really. I've only ever seen one in the hand press era because you print off uh, a book sheet by sheet, so you never have a complete proof copy assembled before you go ahead with the print run. It's an anachronistic term. But we'll give them the benefit of the doubt for now and say, okay, um, this, that's a plausible explanation for what this object is. Just as I was reviewing their, uh, their book, a, uh, their study, a story broke in the international press, initially in Italy, and then it spread as it got worse and worse, ending up in the New York Times, about these two characters, mainly uh, the guy who's not a priest, Sometimes this picture is beautifully cropped so that, um, so that the other guy, Massimo De Caro, looks as though he has three hands. 
Uh, and it, uh, it turned out that what he was using his third hand for was stealing books. He's pictured here in the Girolamini Library in Naples, uh, a library that was founded in the 1580s. And through political connections and definitely not academic uh, credentials, uh, Massimo De Caro had been, um, been named director of this library. One of the security staff in this library had been instructed to turn off security cameras at night uh, and had decided to disobey the director's uh, orders and left the cameras running and took the footage of the director loading up his van with hundreds and in fact in the end probably between four and six thousand rare books. Um, uh, took that to the police and started an investigation, which led to uh, Massimo De Caro being uh, sentenced to jail for seven years. He's about to come out. Uh, it turned out that he's also stolen from a minimum of five other um, libraries. So this story seemed initially unconnected, but then it, uh, I realized that I'd heard Massimo De Caro's name uh, when I talked to dealers, and that there was actually a, a strong connection between Massimo De Caro and Galileo. He'd written a, he'd put together a collection of Galileana and uh, cataloged it. Uh, and everyone I talked to in the rare book world said, oh yeah, that guy. Like, I try and steer clear with him because there's always problems with his books. Um, so I started to wonder whether there might be any connection between Massimo De Caro and the uh, appearance on the market of the Sidereus Nuncius. Started to dig a little bit, and it turned out that one of the sources of dealer resentment of Massimo De Caro was that some of his stock was, well, all of his stock was actually too good to be true. But one batch was actually uh, really phenomenal and completely licit. Um, this is a list of books that Massimo De Caro obtained from the Vatican Library. They deaccessioned these books. They deny that they did this, but um, they did it. They've covered the traces of this deaccessioning from their catalog. Uh, the catalog are actually put in notes saying given to Massimo De Caro, and that's all been scrubbed from their, from their catalogs now. But uh, you can see the books that he received are, are listed on the left. Um, a Compasso, um, a Sagittoria, a Dialogo. Uh, if you look at the shelf marks, which are just underneath, you'll see that name Barberini. That's the Pope's, Pope Urban VIII's own copy of the Dialogo, which is the book that, uh, for which Galileo is um, forced to abjure uh, vehement suspicion of heresy. Um, a copy of the Discorsi, and then just for good measure, they gave him a Hypnorota Machia Polyphily, just because it's fun to say, but it's also worth a million bucks. And uh, the first book to be printed in Italy, the Lactantius um, Opera. Uh, total value on the left, um, pro we're probably looking at minimum of $5 million, possibly a lot more. In exchange, they gave him some books worth about 100,000. And I can't work out why this exchange ever went down, because it was clearly not in the Vatican's interest. But they didn't do this, they say, so it doesn't matter. So he had this nice little nucleus of genuine Galilean stuff, dream items from papal library, actually illegally deaccessioned on the Galileo, um, on the uh, Vatican's um, own terms. They're not allowed to give away papal uh, material. Um, and this put Massimo De Caro in a very uh, strong position to uh, start wheeling and dealing high-end items. Now, the copy of the, the first book on that list, the Operazione del Compasso, Galileo's first book published under his own name, uh, had been microfilmed previously. So you could see uh, what that book looked like, even though it was no longer accessible in the, in the library. It's just temporarily inaccessible for a very long time, according to the Vatican. You can see that there's a library stamp there, and it's, it was actually uh, the Cesi um, library copy, and that's genuine. So in 2003, um, Massimo De Caro got hold not only of a, some really nice Galileo books, he also had an authentic example of this library stamp. 
Uh, and that made me wonder whether the fake library stamp on the Sidarius Nuncius might have something to do with, with him. Various other genuine books were appearing on the market at the same time. Second edition Copernicus, um, um, Cato and Ortelius, uh, all with this same stamp with the uh, intact line. And they were all coming from the same set of dealers. And if you scratched a little bit there, you found out that they'd all come from Massimo Ducado. So I was suspicious of that stamp. Now, in the same period, in about 2005, um, that's that book, The Operazioni del Compasso, which is a rare book, rarer than the Sidarius Nuncius. There are probably uh, maybe 30 copies in the world. Um, about somewhere between two and five, depending on who you talk to, uh, copies appeared on the market, which is quite peculiar for such a rare book. Usually there's one every 10 years maximum. Then suddenly there were two, and then there might have been a third or a fourth or a fifth. Um, and these copies all had, uh, so a dealer who bought one um, was delighted that he had this, uh, this very rare book, was then subsequently offered a second one and immediately became suspicious. And he asked um, experts in the history of astronomy and printing to take a really close look at it. And they found that not only was the paper stock not right, but in the dedicatory letter, there was this very, very weird anomaly. So this is supposed to say dal mio, well, it says dal mio, but you can see that there's a kind of uh, shearing or something's happened there, which if you think of how books are made out of bits of metal type, is just impossible. You can't shear off a whole bunch of letters. Letters could have their body slightly bent, maybe, but this is typographically impossible. It looks a lot more like somebody has nudged a scanner or a photocopier or something like that. And those, as far as I know, didn't exist in 1606. <laughs> so these books were uh, quietly um, dealt with. There was nothing published about these, but various dealers became aware that a, a monster had been let out of its cage. Nobody really thought that print books could be forged. They have been repeatedly, but the story was that whereas the art world, the fine art world, is rife with forgeries, Print, um, printed rare material is immune from that because it's just too hard to, uh, to forge print stuff. And that you'd be able to tell because you can tell when a page is facsimile because it's flat and lifeless. Um, so how was this made was the, uh, the big quandary. Uh, I tracked down another copy which had appeared in the library. They were delighted that Massimo De Caro had reached into a, a cupboard and found, or found on top of a cupboard, a book they didn't know they have. They had, and it was a Compasso by Galileo. They were very grateful to him until they looked at those, those words and found that this was also a forgery. And simultaneously, 13 of their own books disappeared from their library, to which uh, De Caro had been given unfettered access. He should have been fettered. <laughs> okay, some other books started appearing at the same time. In 2005, at Sotheby's, uh, unnamed consigner, who was, it turns out, Massimo De Caro, uh, consigned a copy of the Sidereus Nuncius. It was described as being a hybrid. Um, and what was meant by that was that the book itself, the type, the woodcuts were all genuine, but that the illustrations of the moon were supplied in facsimile which is a kind of weird thing to do, but you never know at the end of the 19th century whether somebody sees blanks and they want the real thing and they would put in a facsimile. The copy didn't sell and it subsequently disappeared, so all we had was the uh, Sotheby's photos of that, of that copy. This became a crucial piece of evidence in working out what was going on uh, in the larger picture. Some other copies uh, will fall into place. There's a genuine copy in Milan in the Brera, um, there's a facsimile made in 1964 from the copy in uh, the Brera. And there's another copy which emerged also in 2005 on, offered for sale by the uh, French dealer Patrick Sauger, um, of which we also only have this photograph. Um, 
and that has also that copy's disappeared. But this seems to be a genuine copy uh, with a strange library stamp on it. We'll come to that in a minute. Now, to work out how these copies fit together, we have to look at um, go back to the Martin Land copy and analyze each of the uh, other bits of evidence there uh, and see what's real about it and what's not. So we saw that the library stamp uh, was in all likelihood forged. But the next bit of evidence, and the best bit of evidence, is this inscription, Eo Galileo Galilei, and then you can just see uh, the letter F, um, Feci, did this. Um, the only uh, dedicatory copy we have of the Sidereus Nuncius is in Oklahoma, uh, University Library, and that's what Galileo's signature looked like in 1610. So that's not a very good match. Um, if, however, you look at Galileo's abjuration certificate from 1633 and place it next to the inscription on the, um, the Martin Land copy, you see a very close similarity. Even that cross on the E on the capital I, I think is just a little mark on the paper that has uh, been misunderstood by a forger and turned into this fake inscription. So um, the abjuration from 1633 turns into a 1610 signature. Uh, that's an anachronism and a forgery. Now, so it seemed to me that even if this copy were genuine, uh, it probably had nothing to do with Galileo. I'm not qualified to judge whether a watercolor drawing is in one artist's hand or, or another, but the crumbling of the rest of this evidence made me very suspicious of that. With the parallel, potential parallel of the forged compasso with that weird shearing effect though, I wondered whether the entire thing might be a fake, um, which would be really, really troubling. It could just have been a doctored genuine copy, uh, Galileo's signature put on it to boost its value, that was one uh, plausible scenario, but what if the entire thing was a forgery? So I looked very, very closely uh, at the title pages of about 30 uh, Sidereus Nunciuses, which I don't recommend to anyone. Um, but I started seeing some weird things in the Martian Land copy. The first was that there were a series of little dots, little beauty spots, uh, which I initially thought were just flecks of ink from the printer's shop or maybe very dark foxing of the paper, although they're very, very black. Um, I noticed that they, this dot also appeared on that copy that came up uh, for auction at Sotheby's and didn't sell. Um, but it was never in any genuine copy. So it couldn't be formed from a typographical character having a weird uh, malformation. Uh, and it puzzled me that it was in these two copies and not in any others. There seemed to be a, a very close genetic relationship emerging between these two copies, the Sotheby's one and the Martin Land one. This uh, twin ship, if that's a word, uh, appeared elsewhere. There's actually a strange typographical error on the Martin Land copy. Instead of the correct reading periodis to describe the periods of the satellites of Jupiter, oops, it says Pepiodis. And you can see there already, those of you who've uh, set type, that the P and the I don't look like they're separate pieces of type. They're actually touching there. And if you think of these letters as being the inked impressions of lumps of metal, it's very hard to imagine how the P and the I could actually touch like that unless somebody had cast a pie ligature because they liked pies or something. Um, on the Sotheby's copy, that's also present. So this twin ship was getting stronger and stronger. The strangest thing, though, was in this increasingly strange book, is this uh, blotch on the letter P in the word privilegio. Um, when we looked at this, or when Paul Needham looked at this, I'd never actually seen the uh, Martin Land copy, but uh, when Paul Needham looked at it, he said that this isn't just a smear of ink or a blotch of ink on the surface of the page. This is actually imprinted into the page. And if you think of that as a typographical character, there's been some weird kind of rupture of a mold. Uh, and it's basically physically impossible for that to be a printed character unless somebody's designing a whole new uh, kind of doctor's use on beyond the uh, alphabet. Now that 
strange kind of club-footed P is uh, present in the 1964 facsimile that was published in Pisa. It's also present, or it used to be, in the Wikipedia page image of the Sidereus Nuncius title page. At that point, I thought, so it, if it's in the wiki image, it must be in all images because wiki is always true. <laughs> but then, and it's in the Sotheby's uh, copy too. But then you go looking at any genuine copy and it's not there. I did a little file search in the Wikipedia image to wonder where that image came from. And it turned out it was made from the 1964 facsimile. So the question then is, well, where's the 1964 facsimile come from? It says it comes from a copy in Florence, but actually it comes from a copy in Milan, in the Brera. And if you get an image of the Milan copy, yeah, yes, that's what I said. Uh, there is some foxing there, and if you get in close to that foxing, and imagine what happens when that foxing is photographed in black and white, and that brown register is not whited out, and it registers as black, what you get is precisely what we see in the Martin Land copy. Now, if the uh, 1964 facsimile was produced by photography in 1964, then logically the Martin Land copy and the Sotheby's copy and the copy I discovered yesterday and probably a couple of other copies all post-date 1964 because the camera produced that artifact, not a printer's workshop. This then uh, didn't solve all of the problems. I'd shown that that P show, uh, that was definitive evidence that the book was a forgery. The paper, the printing, everything about it was forged. Uh, we knew that the inscription was forged and that the library stamp was forged, but everything from the paper up um, was, was a complete forgery. However, what I next noticed was, was that these, um, those dots were still puzzling me. And I noticed that in this Sorge copy, also for sale in 2005, also it seems previously owned by Massimo De Caro, um, those dots appeared, uh, and in fact they were uh, either inking dots or foxing dots. You can see these little splodges in the genuine copy reappear in the forged copy. Uh, most evidently, I guess, because they're hardest to white out in the printer's ornament here. Uh, there are loads of them. It's a bad case of forgery. Um, what was strange, though, was that uh, that big blotch on the P in Privilegio is not present in this one. And I'd already proved that that came from the Brera copy. So it seems that the title page is a hybrid of two different images which have been spliced together. Everything above the imprint is from the Sorge copy, uh, but the imprint is from uh, the 1964 facsimile. And I think the reason for that uh, being done is that these two last lines of text are unusable. The imprint has clearly had a previous library stamp effaced scrubbed off, sanded away, and a fake library stamp put there to uh, di divert the eye from the, um, the text that's been abraded away from that imprint line. But that renders this co or rendered this copy unusable in its entirety as the model for the forgery. Um, and you can prove this hybrid uh, relationship by, uh, again, very, very uh, geekily, drawing a little line, those red lines, these are through genuine copies. I drew a line from the nose of the caryatid at the top through the nose of the, are they still caryatids when they're at the base of something? I don't know, maybe there's another word. But I like to say caryatid. Uh, and saw at what point it um, bisected the, the line of text. And you see that it's always, as you'd expose, as you'd expect, in a composed form, nothing should be jiggling around. The relationship between the wood block and the text should be uh, standard. When you go to the forged copies, uh, it's just very slightly off. So that's an artifact of the digital splicing together of these two different source images. And they didn't line it, line it up quite right. It's close, but no price. 
Um, I have another 10 minutes of talk, or we could stop here for questions. Um, which would you like to do? Continue? Is that all right? Yeah, okay. Let's keep going now. And I'll, uh, I'll bring it in at under uh, 6.55 max, I promise. Um, we can't do this kind of analysis on every book that comes onto the market that uh, sets the hairs on the back of our neck a little uh, um, up. We need to work out what a reliable uh, test might be to identify this mode of uh, forgery. So first of all, we have to work out how these forgeries were done. It was considered previously to be impossible. Most facsimiles that are made um, are made using planographic printing. So they do not impress into the surface of the paper. Um, lithographic uh, fo or photographic or lithographic um, printing won't leave an impression in the paper. It'll just leave uh, inking. Whereas type uh, leaves an impression as well as inking. What I became interested in, uh, and I hope no one else has ever been interested in this, is the furniture, the, the marks left by the furniture around uh, composed type. So the bits of spacing bars. And I decided to do a little thought experiment. So the most likely contender for these forgeries, we needed a printing surface that uh, could produce, could be uh, produced photographically, but would then leave an impression. The obvious thing to do, which none of the um, dealers or academics seem to have done, was to go and talk to printers about how they would forge a, an early modern book. And all of the printers I spoke to said, well, you'd use photopolymer plates. And I said, what? I've, I've read... I've read the history of the hand press, but it stops in 1850. What, what are these photopolymer plates? They're bits of light-sensitive plastic, similar to the, um, the stuff that's put on your teeth and then the dentist uh, shines that bright light and that makes them harden. If you do the same thing with a sheet of plastic, uh, you lay a negative on it, you expose it to light. The um, exposed bits will harden, the rest of it can just be scrubbed away, and what you get is a three-dimensional printing plate. And this. I'm sorry to have to disappoint you. When you have wedding invitations printed and it says letterpress printing, nobody's setting type, apart from in the really uh, hardcore areas of Brooklyn. People are just using, when they say letterpress, they mean photopolymer plates nowadays. Sorry. So, thought experiment. If you have some uh, composed type and you ink it up, uh, we know that the ink is meant to go on the face of the type and then you push that onto the paper and that's how printing works. Good job, Gutenberg. Well, good job, Koreans, actually. But good job, Gutenberg, too, uh, for independently inventing that much later. But what I wanted to know was what happened when the, uh, the ink got into the cracks in the furniture, the wood or metal spacing bars there. Um, what would happen... Because if you've dealt with early modern books, you'll often have seen these little lines, these just little messy bits in the header and footer of a book or around the pagination uh, areas. And you'll, you'll realize that that's just an artifact of, of printing. It doesn't matter. It's not meant to be there. But it might imply quick or cheap or shoddy printing. It might not. It means that the frisket uh, hasn't been cut properly. But uh, it's often, often there. What would happen, I asked myself, Wilding, what would happen if you were to print from this? Well, you'd get a sheet which was deeply impressed and inked where the letter form was, but just had a very light uh, mark where the ink had superficially rested in those cracks. There would be no pressure behind those, uh, that ink to force it into the page. So you just get a uh, you get two, in effect, two different levels of printing. Impressed printing and non-impressed printing. The taxonomies we invent. If you were then to turn that printed image photographically into a photopolymer plate, though, what would that plate look like? Well, the plate doesn't know what was initially a typographic character and what was unintentional inking. The, the plate turns a two-dimensional black-and-white image into a three-dimensional object from which you can print. 
And so you'd get a photopolymer plate that looks something like that. I apologize for my uh, very limited SketchUp skills here. Uh, but something like that. And if you print from that, then the, shoulder, the um, line at the top is going to print in exactly the same way as the typographic characters. Was this the, then actually the case in the uh, Sidereus Nuncius? So what I'm interested in are these line, that little messy line at the top. Um, what, what I've done here is, sorry, not that. What I've done is take folio 3R um, and then taken folio 3 verso. So we're looking at the back of this page and then I flipped it so that anything that shows through from this page on the reverse uh, should read correctly. So the typographic characters, like the number three, you can see uh, faintly, uh, but it does show through. And actually, there's a physical impression there. You could feel that with your, with your finger. But that shoulder ink doesn't leave any mark, right? Because there's no, nothing pushing it through. It's just uh, you might, if you held it up to the light, be able to see it. But, um, but there'd be no physical impression pushing through onto the back of the sheet. That makes sense? Good. You're a smart crowd. I like it. Let's push on. So the Martian land copy. What happens with the Martian land copy? There's not much shouldering. Most of the, um, most of the pages are su suspiciously clean. But in the few instances of shouldering, A, it looks very heavy. See that line at the top there? That's what I'm talking about. And when you look at the back of the page and reverse it, you see no difference at all between typographic impression or impression from typographic characters and impression from uh, whatever it is that's, that's being used. So the shouldering impresses as well as leaves inking. So that means what we're dealing with is uh, probably, well, this has been confirmed now by the forger, Massimo De Cardo, who's admitted to this, but never been charged with anything, um, that this was the technique used. Now, some historians started saying, well, this shows that uh, Massimo De Cardo, when he admitted uh, having made the Martin Land copy, said that this was a glorious hoax to show that the emperor has no clothes in academia. Um, wasn't it funny? I almost got away with it, um, were, were it not for that Scooby-Doo Nick Wilding. Um, one of the arguments that academics made was that this process would have been incredibly laborious and expensive, and that um, there was no financial incentive to do these forgeries. So this was, in fact, a hoax. A printer has told me he could make a better forgery of this using photopolymer plates for under $5,000. Uh, so I don't buy that economic um, hoax argument. This is a cheap way of making plates. This is how you do it. You, um, you can just send off your uh, photograph to a plate maker and they will uh, make a plate and scrub it to the depth that you want and off you go and print from it. These things cost about 10 bucks each. This is not an expensive technology. The problem is actually, uh, I'm indebted here to my, um, my friend, the printer, Russell Moret, based in New York, great printer. Uh, he spent an afternoon forging a forgery with me. Um, so here he is working out uh, very, very swiftly in a way that was far better than uh, the solution that Massimo De Caro uh, came up with, how you'd make a forgery. The problem is actually... Um, Making a 16th or 17th or 18th century book look badly printed enough. If you go off with these plates, they're com completely uniform level. And if you've dealt with early modern books, you realize that the printing surface is kind of rugged. So you need to, uh, to get this kind of deep impression coming through, uh, the not looking too regular. You actually have to pack the... Um, underneath the plates, or underneath the, uh, the sheet that you're going to print with, with um, kind of a, a rolling landscape to give the irregularities of early modern print. Very easy to uh, forge these things. Now some, although this technology works relatively well for 
typographic characters where you want that rich, deep impression. This is what we fetishize now in rare books. We like the feel of them. We tut our heads at the 19th century collectors who ironed their books flat because they wanted them to look like lithographs, the fools. Um, we want that deep impression. It doesn't work well for uh, other, um, other media. So here's one of the, this is actually a forgery of um, one of De Caro's uh, etchings. And you can see that there's a kind of mottling there that doesn't, doesn't look like the background of, a, of um, left on a copper plate. Um, here's another, uh, that's another forgery. And uh, again, it doesn't have the right kind of warmth to it. This is what it should look like, with all that varied, very subtle tone difference of, um, of almost browns, uh, and the plate press, which is completely lacking in these forgeries. To conclude, um, why does it matter? Shouldn't everybody have a first edition? Isn't this just a democratization of a very elitist, snobby world? Well, I can kind of see that this is, there's a logic here of really good facsimile making. These are museum quality facsimiles. And as such, they serve a purpose. But if we start to dissolve that division, kind of ontologically, between genuine historical primary documentation and um, museum facsimile, um, I think as historians and as book historians, we're opening up some, we're creating really deep problems. The integrity of the historical document really matters. And even for a mechanically reproduced object, such as the printed book, it does matter whether our, if our survival rate suddenly goes up from 20% to 50%, that's going to change how we write the history of these objects. So the detection of this new generation of forgeries, and I'm sure that we are only just beginning this era of forgery, it's not over at all. Um, the detection of this is extremely laborious. There are workarounds. Any of you now could uh, go and make a better plate than Takaro and make a better forgery. Um, and there's going, the long-term cat and mouse game between forgers and authenticators and deauthenticators is going to carry on. But the take-home message, I think, is um, we have to uh, try to preserve the value of collections such as the one we're standing in now. Thank you. Thank you.